Well, please turn back in your Bibles to uh, the book of 2 Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 22. And while you're turning there, I want to say again what a privilege it is to come and bring God's word to you this morning here at Melbourne Hall. Uh, Tammy and I uh, have really fond memories of the 12 years we were here, and it was a real honor and uh, delight to be invited to come and see you all, see familiar faces and some new faces as well, and we're looking forward to fellowship with you today. I also bring the uh, greetings of Countess Thorpe Baptist Church, our home church just a few miles away uh, this morning. Uh, let's just pray before we hear the preaching of God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word to us, and we know that we cannot understand it aright. We cannot obey it aright without the Spirit opening our eyes. And so we pray, Lord, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. For we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. I wonder if you're somebody who loves a rescue story. A rescue story. Do you know the Bible is a rescue story? The whole story of the Bible is about God entering into humanity to rescue people who were perishing and to give them the greatest gift possible for rebellious sinners, pardon and everlasting life. That's the summary of the the message of the Scriptures. But you've probably noticed if you've read through your Bible that there are dozens of little rescue stories found throughout the pages of Scripture. And we're going to look at one of those rescue stories this morning. It's one of my favorites. And it's the story of the rescue of a baby boy, a little child. And that baby boy's name is Joash. There's going to be a a few Old Testament names, so just try and keep them in your head there. Baby Joash. Now, what did baby Joash need rescuing from? Well, this might surprise you, but baby Joash needed rescuing from his own grandmother. You see, Joash's grandmother wanted to kill him. Now, some of you have grandparents, and you you think about your grandma if she's still alive, and you, or maybe she's in glory now, and you think, well, she was such a sweet person, or she's such a sweet person, I couldn't imagine that. Or maybe your grandparents here, and and, and you say, I wouldn't ever dream of laying a hand on my grandchild. Yet, the story here tells us, in verse 10, now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Now, why would this grandmother want to try and kill her own grandson? Well, the answer is in, firstly, who she was. We're told that this grandmother's name was Athaliah. Now, who was Athaliah? Well, the Bible teaches in chapter 21 of uh, 2 Chronicles that Athaliah was the daughter of King Ahab. Look at chapter 21 and verse 6. It's talking about Athaliah's husband, Jehoram, and it says here, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. King Jehoram was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. But you may remember, and perhaps you've uh, studied this, you've read it yourself, or maybe you've covered it at Sunday school, uh, that... King Ahab was the evil king of the northern kingdom. And King Ahab did not love the Lord, but he hated the Lord. He wanted to worship Baal. He wanted to worship pagan gods. And he was married to a Phoenician woman called Jezebel. And Ahab and Jezebel worked together to try and kill the prophets of the Lord, to try and stamp out the worship of God in Israel. And so it should be no surprise to us that their daughter, Athaliah, followed in their footsteps. She was an evil woman. 
And what she wanted to do was to wipe out all the rightful descendants to the throne of David. This is what uh, verse 10 tells us. Uh, Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. Athaliah was married to Jehoram, one of the kings of Judah, as I mentioned, and they had a son called Ahaziah. And Ahaziah only reigned for one year because he was such a wicked king. God uh, took him away. God killed him after one year. And there was suddenly this void of power in the southern kingdom of Judah. All of Ahaziah's sons were very young, and so they weren't able to rule. And as is often the case, one person's vulnerability is an evil person's opportunity. And so Queen Athaliah seizes uh, this opportunity to gain power and to institute pagan worship in the southern kingdom of Judah. So she goes, and she systematically seeks to kill off all the rightful heirs to the throne and establish her own dominion. But, you know, on a human level, that's what was happening. But when we look at the grand story of the Bible, something else was taking place. Do you remember the promise we thought about in the children's talk? God had promised that a son would come From Eve, a descendant would come who would crush the head of the serpent, and that descendant would come from a particular family. And we, as we go through the Bible, we find that descendant would come from the family of David. And as we read through the Bible, we find this over and over again, that Satan is trying to kill off this chosen family, because he knows if he can get rid of the chosen family, he will get rid of the Savior, and there'll be no salvation for you and for me. And so behind Athaliah's terrible actions is Satan himself seeking to destroy the promised rescuer. Now it seemed like Athaliah succeeded. That's how verse 10 is written. It indicates for us that for the people living at the time in Judah, it seemed like Athaliah had succeeded in killing off all of the descendants of David. Just imagine the scene. You're having your dinner in Jerusalem. You're a a faithful Jewish family. You, You know the promise that there's going to be a king. He would sit on the throne of David. And you believe that promise. But then there's a knock at the door. And you think, who's that? You open the door, and it's, it's Miriam, a friend of yours. She works at the palace. And she's distraught, and she's in tears. And you say, what's wrong? Sit down. Come on, calm down. What's the problem? And Miriam says to you this, they're all dead. They're, they're all dead. All of the, the children of, of David, the children of Ahaziah, the family, they're, they're wiped out by Athaliah. What would you say in that situation? Perhaps you'd say this. Well, God has promised it. God has promised a son uh, that would reign. It cannot be that all the family would be wiped out. But look at verse 12. He, that's Joash, was hidden with them in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. You see, for most people living at that time, they had no idea about Joash. And so you're that faithful family, and you wait days, and you say, surely we're going to hear news of a, of a, of a descendant that was saved. Surely we're going to hear news of, 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 of one of the children of Ahaziah, but weeks go by, and months go by, and years go by, and you hear nothing. And in all that time, Athaliah is reigning, and uh, pagan worship is instituted, and you cannot worship the Lord... What do you do with the word of God then? You know, that situation that the people at that time lived in, that they faced, is not very different to the situation that you and I often face if you were a Christian here today. And that's this, that we have the promise of God, 
In fact, we have many promises from God. And yet often, everything in our experience and in our understanding of the situation, and even in our feelings, seems to contradict what God has promised in His Word. Jesus said, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Yet you feel utterly forsaken by God. And you have that promise, yet you feel so distant from the Lord. What do you do then? What do you do when that precious child, that mother or father or brother or sister, who is unconverted, seems to be so dead that not even a, all of your prayers and tears in the secret place will move them one inch closer to the Lord Jesus? And yet, the Bible says, seek and you shall find. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. But you see no change in that precious loved one as you pray for them. What do you do with God's promise then? What do you do with the promise of God when the mortgage is due for renewal and the interest rates are going up and the household bills are going up and you look at your salary and you look at what's going to be happening and you say, I can't afford it. Yet the Bible says this, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise. What do you do when there's this this contradiction, it seems, between your experience and God's word. What do you do when some terrible injustice is suffered by you? Someone does something to you, and there's no repentance, there's no change in them, and they seem to just get away with it. And the Bible says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And you say, Lord, your word says this, but my experience says something so different. That's the question I want to answer today from this passage. What are you and I to do when that is our experience? When our feelings and experience and understanding of the situation seems to contradict what God has told us in his word, the Bible. Well, the first thing we need to do is this. Be patient because God is working in secret. Be patient because God is working in secret. Look at verse 11. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered, and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. We can imagine the scene, can't we? Murderous Athaliah sends her soldiers into the palace where the king's sons are kept, and it's terrible. They're going room by room, but there is Jehoshabeth, and she hears them coming, and she grabs baby Joash, and she grabs his nurse, and out the back door of the palace, they get out just in time. Now, where does Jehoshabeth take baby Joash? Where does she take him? Look at the text. It tells us that she takes him to the temple. Smart move. Where's the one place that Athaliah does not want to go? Where's the one place she's never going to set foot? It's the very place where the Lord, the true and living God, is worshipped. And so Jehoshabeth who's married to the priest Jehoiada, takes this little baby and the nurse and brings him to the safety of the temple. How many people knew about this? Probably very few. Maybe a few people in the temple knew, but this was top secret. No one outside the walls of the temple could, could know about this because if news got to Athaliah, what would Athaliah do? She would send her troops straight into that temple and she would try and get rid of Joash. But what we see here is that when all seems so dark, when to everyone else the situation seemed utterly hopeless, God was working in secret. 
He was working in a way that most people had absolutely no idea about, and he was keeping his word. Friends, when you face a situation where it seems like there's a contradiction between what God has promised in the Scriptures and your own experience, let me encourage you, please, today, to be patient because you haven't got the whole picture. God is always working in secret. Now, here he was working in secret behind the high walls of the temple. But today, God works in secret in various different ways. Do you know, God is working in secret behind the walls, not of a temple, an earthly temple, but behind uh, the, the veil of heaven. What is the Lord Jesus doing now? He's still working. He's working a work of a high priest. He is praying. He is interceding for his people. And you may be very tried and tempted this morning. You may be in great straits and difficulties, but I can assure you, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus, did you know that Jesus Christ is praying for you right now? He is interceding for you. I wonder if you've ever said to somebody, well, I've poured out some complaint to you, some difficulty, and you've said, I'll pray for you, but then you've forgotten to do it. I've done that, I confess to my shame. But the Lord Jesus Christ never ceases to intercede and pray for you, for me. He never stops, night and day. Robert Murray McChain said this, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. Christ is praying for me. You are on his heart. Now, you can't see that. You can't hear his prayers, can you? Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could? But we cannot. But we can be assured of this. God is working in secret behind the closed doors of heaven, and Christ is interceding for you and for me. But God is also working in the secret place of men's hearts. He's working in hearts. Sometimes gospel work can be discouraging. Sunday school teachers, you know what it's like. You're preparing your lessons day in and day out, and you're teaching and instructing, but perhaps you don't really see much happening on the surface. But that's okay, because God works in the secret place of the heart. And often, it's imperceptible to the eyes and to the ears. When Solomon built the temple, he gave a very interesting instruction. His instruction was this, uh, that there was to be no tools used to to hew the stone, to, to, to chop the stone in the precinct of the temple. It was to be totally quiet as they built the temple. And in a way, that's a picture for us of what it is when the Lord Jesus Christ builds his church. You know, we often want fanfare. We want to see God work in a way that would just, you know, come down in some hugely manifested way and blast all those who are unbelieving and and mock him and, and vindicate his name. And there is a sense in which God will do that one day. But in this present age, do you know, friends, the Lord builds his church quietly Don't be discouraged when you don't see results immediately. Be patient because God is working in the secret place of the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, work colleagues, friends, family, children that you're praying for and you're laboring to reach. He's working in the secret place of the hearts of believers and you're in this situation perhaps and you're struggling and you can't put it all together and you don't know the answers but you don't know it, but God is humbling you. Perhaps the Lord is, is weaning your heart from the things of this world and causing you to live closer to him and to, to find his word more precious. 
I was just speaking to a man a couple of weeks ago, and his daughter, though raised in a Christian home, turned away from the Lord and has chosen a lifestyle, lifestyle that is utterly destructive to her body, to her mind, and his heart is broken. But he said this to me, he said, Joe, the Bible has never been more precious to me. The Bible's never been more precious. God was working in his heart, though we couldn't see it at the time. God is working in the secret place of providence. What is providence? It is God's uh, wise and good and powerful governing all of his creatures and all of their actions. Nothing happens by accident under God's sovereign control. And the Bible assures us that God is working in every single moment of history. And he's weaving it all together in his sovereign wisdom for your good if you are a Christian here this morning. Don't give up. Don't doubt the word of God. Be patient because God is working in secret. But this passage teaches us something else that we must do at such times. And secondly, we must do this. We must be faithful because God is working in ordinary obedience. Be faithful because God is working in ordinary obedience. Who is it that God chose to rescue King Joash from the clutches of Athaliah? Was it some great military general? Was it some mighty prophet who came with flaming fire from heaven? No. It was a woman. A woman who was a relative of Joash. Jehoshabeth was Joash's auntie. And she loved the Lord. And in her capacity as an auntie, and in her capacity as a wife married to Jehoiada, she adopts Joash into their family and raises this little vulnerable baby as her own child. She's faithful. And it's not particularly glamorous. Her actions were only known about afterwards. That rescue operation, that raising of Joash was hidden from the eyes of most people. But she was faithful in the place that God had placed her. Now, I wonder if you've ever thought like this to yourself. Well, if only I was in a different situation, then I'd be far more useful to the Lord. If only I was a missionary in some far-flung place. If only I didn't have this burden of this particular thing that holds me back or this particular responsibility that I carry, that then I would be more useful to the Lord. But that's not what our text teaches us. Our text teaches us that Jehoshabeth was useful to the Lord in the very place that he had put her. There were unique opportunities for Jehoshabeth to do good that no one else could. You see, only Jehoshabeth, as the daughter of King Jehoram, had access to the palace. And so she was in the right place at the right time to rescue this baby boy. Don't despise the place that God has put you in. Ephesians 2 says that for every believer, there are good works that God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. And they are opportunities to do good that only you can do. Some of them will be very risky. Jehoshabeth's obedience could have cost her her life. But she seized the opportunity in the place that God had put her as a wife and as an adoptive mother. It may be costly, as I say. I read recently of, uh, of uh, a teacher in Nottingham, and uh, she had a child in her class who was identifying as the opposite gender. And she raised this as a safeguarding concern. She was a Christian teacher. She was concerned for that child, that everyone else was encouraging that poor child in that confusion. And she raised it as a safeguarding concern and refused to go along 
with that child's new pronouns and name, and she lost her job. She had an opportunity to do good, and she took it, and it was risky, and it cost her her job. Jehoshabeth had an opportunity, and she took it. What opportunities has God placed in your ordinary life to be faithful to him, to do good? But be faithful not only in where God has placed you, but be faithful in very ordinary obedience. Notice verse 12. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Now, often the Bible is very economic with the words it uses. And it describes many ordinary things in the space of just a few words. Now, what was involved in those six years while Joash was adopted into the family of Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth? Well, it was very ordinary stuff. They would have fed him and clothed him and taught him and changed his nappies and did all the things that are involved in family life and in parenting. They no doubt had sleepless nights. And not only that, but add to that the pressure of trying to keep this baby quiet. Now, some of you know we've got two girls, and I thought they were loud. Then we had a boy. And uh, wow, he's got some lungs on him. And I think of Jehoshabeth and Jehoiada, and they've got to somehow keep this baby a secret. Imagine the stress. Oh, he's crying again. We've got to try and quiet him down. Oh, come on, we've got to do something. We can't have him found out about. Just ordinary obedience. Nothing glamorous. Just everyday life. Do you know, God has called most of us to very ordinary obedience. Sometimes I hear preaching, and you hear all these examples of George Whitfield preaching to 10,000, or John Payton going off to the New Hebrides, and we thank God for these men who God used in great ways. But the reality is, for most of us here, most of us will never be George Whitfield or John Payton. We're going to be ordinary little me. You're going to be an ordinary husband perhaps, and your calling is to go out to the workplace and to glorify God in the work that you do, whether that's typing at a computer or painting or preparing lessons or hitting a hammer or running a business or whatever calling God has placed you in, but you are to do that to the glory of God and provide for your family. And sometimes in the mundaneness of life, we can think it's not really adding up to much. You know, you've got to then go home in the evening and you must then give 100% to your wife and children and lead them in worship and teach them from the scriptures. And it doesn't seem to add up to much. Wives, mums, the daily tasks of motherhood. And it seems thankless. It seems constant, the mess, the, 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 the jobs that just seem to accumulate and never be done. And you can say, well, if only I wasn't in this situation, I would surely be more useful to the Lord. I've got to simply uh, get on with this, love and submit to my husband. I've got to uh, serve in this way, which is unglamorous and so ordinary. Young people, you're at home and maybe you're working hard for exams and that's coming up and it, it just seems very uh, humdrum and mundane. And, and, and you, you know, you've just got to get the chores done at home. You've got to be obedient to mum and dad, just ordinary obedience in the Christian life. And again, you can think, well, it's not adding up to much. Or you're serving in the church and it's perhaps a very ordinary role in the church. Nothing glamorous about it. Perhaps not even seen or known by anybody else. Friends, be faithful in those things because God is working in ordinary obedience. Now, how do I know that? What's my reason for saying that? Well, who was Jehoshabeth rescuing in her ordinary obedience? She was rescuing a descendant of David. And from David, from this descendant of David would come the Savior, if it wasn't for Jehoshabeth and Jehoiada raising this little baby boy, if it wasn't for them going through the ordinary obedience of family life, can I tell you this? There will be no Christmas. There will be no Easter. There will be no cross. There will be no resurrection. There will be no heaven for you and me because there will be no Savior. 
How did God bring about the salvation of the world? Well, in part, it was through the ordinary obedience of this woman and man. Don't despise the calling that God has placed you in. Rejoice. Be faithful in it because God is working through you. God is working through you. But you ask me this question, well, how is it? How can we have the endurance to be faithful in those things? Because sometimes life is just hard and we perhaps feel over, overburdened with all that we must do in obedience to, to God's word as Christians. And, and uh, I know that feeling, I know that struggle. What enabled Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth to continue in ordinary obedience? Well, the answer is in the third observation I want to make. The third thing we must do when we're in such times, and that's this. Be hopeful because God will work for all to see. Be hopeful because God will work for all to see. After the six years is up, chapter 23 and verse 1 tells us this. In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself. He strengthened himself. Now, what was the source of Jehoiada's strength? Because in that strength, he now goes uh, to overthrow Athaliah and coronate King Joash. What is the source of that strength? What is the source of that faithfulness? Well, the answer is found in verse 3. Uh, Jehoiada gathers all of the, um, all, all the leaders of Judah, and he gathers the Levites together, and he speaks to them, And do you know what he says to them? What does he point them to? He points them to the promise of God. Look at verse 3. Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God, and he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. What did Jehoiada believe? What did Jehoshabeth believe? They they were confident that God would keep his word, that Joash would one day reign on the throne, and that from Joash one day would come the promised Savior. And it was that confidence that one day God was going to work publicly. One day God was going to keep his word, and the hidden king would be revealed. That is what enabled them to continue in their ordinary faithfulness in their lives. And that's exactly what happened. God kept his word. It's a very interesting passage, this, and I'd encourage you to read it because it's actually the the only time we have in the Bible a coronation of 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 a king of Judah recorded. And you'll notice if you read it that there's actually some similarities to the coronation that probably many of us watched a couple of weeks ago on TV because the British coronation is based on this very passage. What happens? Well, Joash, sorry, Jehoiada gathers these priests and he arms them and he sets a guard around this uh, little seven-year-old king, uh, Joash, and they bring out the king and they bring him into the temple and uh, they're all around him. And then look at verse 11. And they brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, gave him the testimony and made him king. Then Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said... Long live the king. A wonderful scene. A wonderful scene they'd waited for for so long. The only way that we can remain faithful in ordinary obedience is by hope in the promise of God for the future. We have to be confident that one day God will keep his word And one day, our hidden king will be revealed for all to see. This is what enabled Abraham to obey in that very chapter that we referred to a little earlier on in the the children's talk. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 says this about Abraham's obedience. By faith... 
Abraham obeyed by faith. Now, I know the feeling, you you come here to church on the Lord's Day and you hear uh, about what Christ has done for us and then you hear what we must do in response and and the the, the natural response of our heart is to think, well, if I just grit my teeth and try a bit harder, I can do the Christian life. But you can't. You can't do that. The only way that you can live a life of obedience to Christ is not by your own effort, it's by faith in Christ and faith in his word, and the hope that that brings you. 1 John chapter 3 tells us this, verses 2 to 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The king will be revealed, friends. But look at verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You want greater obedience, greater purity in your life? Then you've got to have the hope, the assurance of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Paul, in the book of Titus, tells us it's a blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when our eyes are fixed on the glory, then the sufferings, the mundanity, the ordinary obedience of this present world and the challenges that brings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will afterward be revealed in you and me. Be hopeful, friends. Because God will work for all to see when Jesus comes and is revealed from heaven on that last day, for every eye will see him. And every promise that he has made in his word will be fulfilled before our eyes and we will rejoice. Keep that eye, keep that day on your horizon, friends. That's what we're looking for. What happened to Athaliah? Well, from verse 12 onwards, we find what happened to Athaliah after Joash is brought out and coronated. We can imagine that perhaps she was sitting in her palace, perhaps eating a grape, perhaps smugly pleased with herself that she was reigning over the kingdom of Judah and had successfully overthrown the the throne of David that she successfully proved the God of Israel to not be true. But listen, now when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. Now this is a woman who's not used to hearing people singing and rejoicing and praising. It was miserable, miserable under Athaliah's reign. And so you can imagine her nose twitching and her ears twitching. What's all this singing outside? What's all this praise? What's all this noise? And so she she comes out of her palace. And then we read this in verse 13. When she looked, there was the king standing by his pillar in the entrance, and the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets, also the singers with musical instruments and those who led in praise. What's Athaliah's response when she sees this? Look what it says. So Athaliah tore her clothes and said, Treason! Treason! Did you get the irony? Treason. Who had committed treason here? Who was the one who had killed the rightful heirs? It was Athaliah. But you know, she got to the point in her life where she was so self-deceived that she thought she had succeeded in overthrowing God's chosen king. She thought she had succeeded in proving the God of the Bible to be false. But she was deceived. Do you know, friends, this is the mentality of everyone outside of Jesus Christ. 
Psalm 2 says this, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. And you know, friends, the world today thinks they've succeeded in overthrowing the law of God, the rule of God. Where is your God now, they say? We don't need to follow your ancient book. We have superseded that with our modern ideas. We can live how we like. We are the masters of our destiny. And maybe that's what you think this morning. Maybe you're here and you say, well, this is all very nice, but you're standing here and saying about all these hidden things. Well, I can't see them. I have, I'm in control of my life. I reign, I rule, or maybe you've grown up in a Christian home and you're looking forward to the day when you can throw off those constraints of the things that your parents have told you you can and can't do. And you think that you can be the master of your destiny and you can dethrone God out of your life and you'll just simply get away with it. That's the mentality of the world. But I want you to see what happens to Athaliah. The deception doesn't last for very long. Look at what verse 14 says. And Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were set over the army and said to them, take her outside under God and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, do not kill her in the house of the Lord. So they seized her and she went by way of the entrance of the horse gate into the king's house and they killed her there. This woman who had set herself up to oppose God's chosen king, and thought she'd succeeded in doing so, ultimately met an awful demise. Can I tell you this, my friends? You cannot reject God's chosen king, our Lord Jesus. You cannot neglect his great salvation offered to you and escape. That's what the book of Hebrews says. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We need to bow the knee to the hidden King Jesus before he is revealed. For those who trusted God's promise, for those who waited for God's chosen king, it was a glorious day. It was a glorious day. Over and over again, we read this word rejoicing. Verse 13, all the people of the land were rejoicing. And then uh, toward the end, verse 21, all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was quiet for they had slain Athaliah with the sword. Quietness simply means peace. No more brutal, evil ruler and dictator ruling over the land. There was joy, there was rejoicing. The rightful king was on the throne and there was peace. And you know, brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, that's what we have to look forward to. There is peace. There is rejoicing coming when the hidden king is revealed. But let me remind you again, if you've yet to come to him, don't be self-deceived that you can throw off his reign. There'll be no peace for you. On that day, only condemnation eternally, a fate even worse than Athaliah faced here physically. We live in dark days, friends. We live in days when often it seems the word of God is difficult. We, it may even seem to contradict our experience and our understanding and our feelings. But can I encourage you, friends, in those days, in those times you face in the Christian life, be patient, because, because God is always working in secret. Be faithful, because God is working through your very ordinary obedience. And finally, be hopeful, because one day the Lord will work for all to see. And what a day that will be. Amen. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its comfort to us in our trials and difficulties. And we pray that you give us that faith to endure, to cling to the promises of God to us. Pray for any here who have yet to bow the knee to your rightful king, our Lord Jesus, the descendant of Joash. And we pray that, Lord, all of us would one day be with him when he's revealed, rejoicing with him on that day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to sing hymn number uh, 600, sorry, no, no, hymn number 280. 280. Lo, he comes with clouds descending. A, a wonderful hymn about that day.
to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, Amen.